as we have a, a quite famous speaker now, which is I don't have to present in this uh, in this scene. Um, Mitch Altman is uh, known as an inventor and also from the hackerspace uh, scene very well. Um, I'm very happy to have him here and to ha get an insight in what he's going to uh, what he sees in Asia uh, happening right now over the last years and maybe in the future. I'm quite curious to hear you and. Uh, I think uh, the audience will get a bit bigger while you're talking. So, thanks, okay. Mitch. <laughs> cool, thank you. So, um, up there, that's my real contact info. Please feel free to use it anytime for any reason. I, I really do love helping people any way I can. Um, I also have a, uh, a free service that I've offered to lots of people and, and many have taken me up on this. If you ever find yourself in a position where you don't like your job, please contact me because I'm really good into talking people into quitting jobs they don't like. Okay? We can do better things with our time than just have a job, that even, especially if you don't like it. So, um, I'm a happy worker because I quit my job and I created my own work and I get enough doing um, what I love. Ooh, I get enough of doing from doing what I love to keep doing what I love. And the project that uh, made that happen for me out of many that I've tried is this one, TV Be Gone. It's a keychain that turns TVs off in public places. And I didn't do that to make money, I just did it because I totally love this project because I totally hate television. Uh, it had too much power over me too much of my life and I made this thing to turn it off and it turned out a lot of people liked it. Friends and friends of friends and friends of friends and that's when I saw an opportunity that actually worked for me. Um, and I've sold over a half a million of these in the world. The last 13 years, me and 12 friends have made a living from this project we love a small, sustainable business. It hasn't grown, but it keeps making us a living doing this project we love. And that's one of the themes I want to impress upon you, that this is possible. If the world had tens of millions or more of these kind of small, sustainable companies, that would be an incredible basis for a real economy that works for way more people than what we have now. Um, but, um, I also started a early hackerspace in the United States called Noisebridge. Uh, I was inspired by a talk at a hacker conference in Germany uh, in 2007, and so were a bunch of other people, and collectively we helped each other start hackerspaces in our own hometowns. Uh, New York City, Washington DC, Philadelphia, and San Francisco, and that's been an example for hackerspaces to go from a few dozen back then to thousands now. Um, but I started giving workshops there on how to solder. Every Monday, since 2007, I've been teaching people how to solder, and here's an early one in 2008. It kind of grew, and I was going all around the world teaching people to solder and other things, uh, and giving talks about how to start hackerspaces and other things. Um, and it's kind of grown to big, massive soldering events like this in another hacker conference just a few years ago in Germany. And the more I do this, doing what I love, the more I get invited to do more of things I love. And I've been going around the world giving talks and workshops, uh, including big talks and whatever. Um, I really love this stuff. And it's been all over the place, including um, in China. But I actually started going to China because that's where I manufacture TV Be Gone. And we have a little video here of the first production line of TV Be Gone in Shenzhen, China, which is now the biggest manufacturing place in the world. And um, it, it was kind of amazing to go through that process of not knowing anything about how to manufacture anything to being really good at it uh, and learning from all of these people who work on that assembly line and the people uh, who manage them. Uh, and it's really cool to see these people who are making these kind of boring, normal kind of uh, products that don't really make the world a better place. Uh, but here they are like testing a TV Be Gone and, and it works. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they had a lot of fun with this project as well as I did. Um, you know, and like packaging it. That was back in 2004. And um, I made a bunch of these before I even knew what they would sell. And like I said, I've sold a half a million since then. But this is the latest batch, which is now my manufacturer's in Shanghai. And um, they, um, they're really nice people. I love working with them. Um, so, you know, I've also, while in China manufacturing, I get invited to give talks. And um, first at little university classes, but then there are people there who invited me to more. And then I get invited to talk to uh, the media from all of China at the Panasonic Center. And from there, I get invited to more, and I start giving talks. You know, this is about how to start a hackerspace in China, right? And um, there are all these people there excited about the idea. And then bureaucrats find out about it, and I start giving talks to education bureaucrats, and then um, uh, bureaucrats just in local governments. And pretty soon, I'm giving talks to hundreds of bureaucrats. Uh, this was just last October. And they're all taking notes about how to start hackerspaces. Uh, it kind of filtered up to the top of government. It wasn't just me. There were other people doing this as well, including Chinese people, which is really important. Um, but the head of government, Premier Li, visited a hackerspace a couple of years ago, uh, one that I visited a lot and did workshops in, uh, Chai Hua in uh, Shenzhen, and he made a big media event out of it and said, this, Hackerspaces, is the future of China for education, for economy, for people's well-being. Kind of amazing. The head of government, well, the US, of course, not to be outdone, had a, a White House maker fear shortly thereafter because they didn't want to be left behind. Uh, but we are left behind because they've been continuing. And of course, we know what happened in my country in the last election. Um, but hackerspaces um, are really fantastic uh, places for so many different reasons. And it's because they're fantastic communities. It's all about community. There's communities of people who get together to do what they feel they might enjoy and hopefully uh, find what they enjoy, what they love, what they find meaning in doing. Um, they get together, they encourage each other to explore and do hopefully what each person loves to do. And we're making all sorts of different things, not just with computers, but with art and craft and science, math, whatever people are into. And we need tools for that. So we collect the tools. It's not about the tools, though. It's about the community. At the top there, community. But tools are cool. We can do lots of them with uh, lots of things with the tools that we have. This one's uh, a place that does mostly mechanics in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. But you know, with hackerspaces, I'm talking about hackerspaces, it's all about hacking. What the hell is hacking? Well, it has lots of definitions, but here's my definition. We see the world as full of resources that we can use any way we want to improve our projects, whatever those projects are. It doesn't have to be tech, it can be anything, and then we share it. And we do it primarily because we love it. It's an incredibly enjoyable thing to do. But it really is a way of living, a way of looking at things. It's a way of being. And I think this is really important. You don't have to be an entrepreneur to be a good hacker. But to be a good entrepreneur, you definitely need to be a good hacker. You need to see things in your own way and do things, try things, fail, try again, learn from all of that, and then try more. And then you come up with something that other people might feel is worthwhile, and that's when you can find an opportunity. So again, what can be hacked? Anything. Electronics, of course, and art and craft and science, yourself. We can hack our own lives because our lives as well as everything else can be improved. We can help our communities, our societies, the planet. We can hack and we should hack everything. And it's up to us to do it. I hope that's why we're all here. <laughs>
But let me just show you just a few uh, random uh, photos from hackerspaces as I travel around the world. Electronics, everyone thinks of here in Paris. There's also laser cutters, of course, and fabrication tools, and small hand tools for making little things. We can do big things as well as cars and huge robots. We can also do art, like this art class in um, uh, painting class in Noisebridge. We can do it with food, like here in Stuttgart, Germany, at Shackspace. And this is not just for people of a certain age. It's not just for little kids. It's not just for old people. It's for everybody. And every community is for people of whatever ages are part of that community. And this is why they're fantastic learning environments. It's because, as the last speaker, if you saw them, was talking about hands-on, project-based, play-based learning is the best way to learn. If you make time to explore and do what you love, you find something you love, you find a project you love, then you're way motivated to make that project as cool as possible, and you'll learn everything you need and hopefully more in order to make your project awesome. And as you find you don't have uh, the knowledge you need, you find... Uh, the resources, including people in your community, to make it better. But overall, it is a supportive community that encourages everyone to explore and do what they love. And this is everywhere in the world, and I'm getting to China. This is how true innovation happens. People come up with something perfect for them, and therefore, it's probably really good for others in their local community, and maybe it grows and it's good for even more people. I've been going to China, and I've been going there since 2003, uh, a month or more every year, so I have my own warped view of what China's like. I'm certainly no expert on Asian or Chinese culture, but this is like my perspectives that I'm gonna share. China has some serious, as the rest of the world, has serious economic problems. Um, they've gone from basically a third world developing country to first world in a very short amount of time at the expense of their environment, unfortunately, but by manufacturing, Western goods for Western or Western corporations that are shipped halfway around the planet. This isn't going to last forever. Um, their economy has gone up. Uh, we have to pay people more, and we should pay people more. Their environment is going to hell. Um, it's focused more and more on um, uh, taking tests in schools. So you get the best schools, you get the best jobs, and it's not about learning, and so people aren't actually learning. They're focusing their creativity on copying Western goods so they can sell them in the West halfway around the planet. Shipping prices are going up. The exchange rates uh, are going the wrong direction to make it okay for Western manu uh, corporations to manufacture in China, and all of this doesn't add up to goodness for the future of the economy in China. But I don't think this is going to happen because there are a lot of far-sighted people who are actually in the government of China doing many good things along with many bad things like other governments. Uh, it's all matters of degree. Um, but in order for this to happen, some things need to shift there, and this is why I think the bureaucrats and all these people have been inviting me to speak, because I, as an outsider, with some perspectives maybe that resonate with people there, uh, can give some very unorthodox perspectives. Um, we can shift some things. There are all these resources there, and with hackerspaces, we can have a safe environment for people to play to try things, to not be so terrified of failing. It's a safe environment to try and fail and learn. It's great for learning. It's also great for the economy because of people finding things that can make startups that aren't stupid. Have you noticed that most startups are stupid? <laughs> they are. Almost all of them are stupid. And if you look at, hit, at startups, almost all of them fail. Not only because they're stupid, there's also people who aren't so good at running a small business or at marketing and all these other things that are needed. But um, a lot of them fail because they're incredibly stupid. <clears throat> no exceptions in China there. But having a hackerspace means that people can explore, maybe find projects they love. If they love it, the people in their community might love it. If people in the community do, maybe the people in the outlying community do. And then people can find an opportunity that might be a startup worth starting. Once you have that idea, then we can have 
co-working spaces, which there are a lot of in China, and even where people can go and, and work on their ideas to bring them into reality with other people doing similar for their own, as well as having training for that with places like incubators, accelerators, which is what that's about. Incubator, accelerator, kind of the same thing. So this is what people in China, bureaucrats all the way to the top, are really looking for with hackerspaces. They really want hackerspaces to help for the future of the Chinese economy. Education everywhere in the world is terrible. It really sucks. It's become all about tests, which are supposedly about the evaluation of learning. Why do we take tests? We don't take tests just to take the test. Well, now we do. But the test is supposed to be how well we learned. But every Every research study done about education shows that the only correlation of tests and anything else is not about how to live your life, not about a better job, not about what you've learned. The only thing that correlates with a test is how well you take tests. We have been developing on our planet the best test takers ever. And in China, where there's such pressure to do well on these entrance exams, they have created the best test takers on the planet. That doesn't do any good for those people or for China. So people are interested in real education, which is like at a hackerspace, where people find projects they love and do them. And this is why hackerspaces are being incorporated in schools uh, all over the world, not so much, but really big time in China. Um, and. Um, when people have a project they love, they're highly motivated to learn, and if they find they need to learn more, then they have these so-called traditional classes that they can then learn the theory, and they're motivated to learn the theory rather than just using it as a prerequisite for the next class, which is a prerequisite for the next class, which is prerequisites for these classes, which is prerequisites for some degree that you get so you can go get a job you don't even like, so that you can make enough money so you can have food and shelter so that you can barely crawl out of bed in the morning to go back to the job you don't like. That's an option. <laughs> it seems to be the one most people have been choosing. But project-based, um, hands-on, play-based learning really works. So um, hackerspaces all over the world have grown from a few dozen back in 2007, like I said, to thousands in the world. And that's actually an old picture because it doesn't show many in China, which now actually looks as obliterated by pins as North America and Europe because a couple of years ago, the head of government visited this hackerspace and said this is the future of China. And so every bureaucrat in China, in order to show that they are a cool bureaucrat, has to start a hackerspace. So they're starting spaces that look like this. They don't get it. <laughs> They're trying. It might be a good co-working space, but it's not a hacker space. It's not a creative environment where people are going to go explore and try things and come up with cool ideas because they don't have communities like this. There are a lot of really cool hacker spaces in China, though. Some really cool ones. Um, there's just a few of them. So this is at Tsinghua University, where they incorporate, trying more and more to incorporate it into their curriculum. In the years I've been going there and working with people there, they've built what they call the world's largest hackerspace. It's 160,000 square meters. Most of it is filled with stupid stuff, but it's, there's a lot of cool stuff there too. Um, Xinjiajian, which is the first hacker space in China, and it's super cool. Uh, in Shanghai, the Beijing Makerspace, which has turned more and more into co-working space, but still cool stuff happening there. Chai Hua uh, in Shenzhen, here's one in a school um, in Beijing that's, uh, they're starting young, having this part of their curriculum. Um, SCDIY in Shenzhen and Lichi Labs, it just goes on and on. Um, you know, because of this, <laughs> this guy visiting Chai Hua Hackerspace in Shenzhen, this is an amazing time, especially for China, because there's all this money coming from the top down, and at least some of it is getting to the hands of a few people who can create community in the form of hackerspaces from the bottom up so people can actually benefit from it. We definitely want more of this, and not so much this. Um, but uh, China, 
switch gears a little, is amazing resources because of all of this for everybody, because of what was going on before and what's to come. It's amazing manufacturing there. If you have some idea and other people like it, you can maybe have a Kickstarter if you want to or somehow get enough money to manufacture 500 of them. And it's actually not very expensive. Um, you can do that here. All you need is to make about 500 and you can try it out and see if other people like it. And if, pe if people do, you can make more to make them available for people who can benefit from it. Um, and by the way, there are lots of manufacturers in China. Most of them are horrible to their employees, but this is the criteria I use to find mine. And my manufacturer meets all of them. They treat their employees well, they pay them well, they treat the environment well. The place I, uh, I uh, have even has their own chef, so people get the food they want. It's really, really good, as well as having a good price for me and really high quality, better than I could find in the US. Um, Shenzhen is uh, this amazing place. This is a video from someone who I brought to China with a ch hacker trip to China, which I have every year. And he loved it there and he stayed there. You might have seen this video that went viral of him making his own iPhone with uh, stuff that's available in Shenzhen. Just anyone can do that. And he doesn't even speak Mandarin Chinese. Uh, China has... Uh, amazing places like Hua Chong Bay in Shenzhen, and that video was from there. Hua Chong Bay is um, a place with lots and lots and lots of buildings, each with zillions of little stalls that sell all sorts of things like LEDs and tools and um, uh, microcontrollers and capacitors, resistors, springs, motors, cases, wire, anything you can imagine. Um, and this those stalls were just in this little area, which is one floor of one building in this huge area of Shenzhen, China. And there's even more of them. There's a place like that in Beijing and in Shen, uh, Shanghai. Not quite as big, but it's really amazing. And they have lots of maker festivals like what we have here. This is a maker carnival in Shanghai. And um, there are also lots of hacker spaces where you can go and meet new geeky friends and share what you know with them and learn from them and bring them home. Uh, there's amazing tools. If you have a thumb drive with a file or just a sketch, you can bring it to any little stall that has a laser cutter or a CNC mill or a huge place like this, which is a university for learning how to use these, and people will make it for you for incredibly cheap. China is also amazing because it has the coolest signs anywhere. This is one of my favorites, though. This one is about 150 meters long. Even Chinese people don't know what that means. This one's kind of awesome. Not all of China is good, by the way, but we can make use of the positive things and encourage the positive. This was in a PC board manufacturing place. Doesn't that make you feel warm and fuzzy? <laughs> um, but this is my favorite sign. <clears throat> there are also some really cool hardware, co open hardware companies. I had no idea DF Robot was going to be here at Make Munich, uh, but uh, <laughs> hi. Um, but I visited there a bunch. I know the people who started it. It's a really cool company. And uh, this is MakeBlock, which has grown out of uh, an incubator that I'm a mentor from. I'll have a picture of that in a sec. Uh, Seed Studio is the first open hardware company and they do make uh, lots of cool things and they also have manufacturing for any of your open hardware projects. They also have cool art. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's a cool artist. Um, and they have trains better than in Germany. It's really amazing and you can get around so easily and cheaply. Uh, Food. It's not the last and it's not the least, but the food is awesome. Uh, co-working spaces with cool food, cool drinks, and lots of spaces and tools. Uh, incubators. This is the first hardware incubator, and I've been a mentor for that. They now call themselves Hacks, H-A-X. If you have a cool idea and have a prototype that works, you can apply. They'll give you a small pile of money and all the resources and training you need to make it into reality. That's just one, there's lots of them. There's also this website called Taobao. Hua Chong Bay has been sort of getting smaller, it's still huge, because online stuff is even cheaper and better. You can get anything from dresses to 
kitchen stuff or whatever, but you can also get electronics. Here's my latest project. I call it Ardu Touch. It's a music synthesizer kit. It costs me um, actually really little, but I'm charging 30 to get back the money uh, that I put into it, and then I'm going to charge $25 for it. And the only reason I can do that is because of Taobao, because I have friends in China who can order on it for me because you have to know Chinese and have a Chinese address. But just check this out. AliExpress is one that can deliver to Europe or the US. And these little speakers cost 786 in euros to ship to Germany. Free shipping, by the way. That's pretty good price for these pretty decent little speakers. But look on Taobao, the same speakers are 220 RMB, which is 29 cents. And another example, the microcontroller on that is the one used in Arduinos. $1.17 is pretty good price if you get it shipped here for free, but if you go to China, you can get it for 36 cents on Taobao. They also have PC board places. This is a, a website by my friend Ian of Dangerous Prototypes. 10 PCB board, PC boards, including shipping, for $17 US. So that's really cheap, and because of that, I can have my whole bill of materials not be 10 euros and 68 cents if I did it in the US, but three euros doing it in China. And this is from people who actually love their jobs. It's not little kids who are being whipped <laughs> into submission. So anyways, to show about what China has to offer, the pluses and the minuses, uh, I started the hacker trip to China. Here's how we're greeted nowadays uh, at the Beijing airport. And uh, the first trip was uh, in 2009. We got some crazy uh, Mongolian hats with red stars at a temple. Um, we visit manufacturers. And um, as we go along, people who want to give talks and presentations, here we are at a school that invited us and actually paid us to go there. And um, here we are talking to a lot of bureaucrats at a huge conference. Um, if you're interested in joining for that, um, that's the URL. And we, this is the coolest machine porn ever. It's a spring-making machine. It's mesmerizing. Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's in slow motion, by the way. Also in China, there's a lot of opportunities for being a hacker in residence. Whatever it is that you're good at, you can go to there and people will support you and pay you to be there. Some have big budgets like Tsinghua University, some have little ones. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm working and have been working on making this worldwide, some with big budgets, some with no budgets. Uh, right now, it's on hackerspaces.org. There's a bunch of opportunities. Later this year, I'll have hackerinresidence.org, free, free website to post and look at residency opportunities in China and everywhere else in the world. So um, I do everything I do to try to create more opportunities for more people to live the lives they really want to live. So um, if you think I can help in any way, please let me know. But there's lots of opportunities everywhere. Um, and uh, take advantage of them and be, par be part of that for others. So thanks. Mitch, thanks a lot for that insight. I'm sure we have some questions and that is the chance uh, to ask Mitch something from the audience. Questions, comments? Hi, Mitch. Um, yeah, I have a project uh, started that actually would benefit uh, a lot from, uh, you know, this sourcing uh, opportunities because we found out that uh, actually producing something in Germany is not that expensive in itself. The main difference is in the purchasing because the parts are much more expensive here even if you buy a lot. So could you recommend uh, some place to start where we can find people whom we can trust? Because that's a bit difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. So could you hear the question? Yeah. So. Um, 
there are definitely cool places in Germany where you can get your stuff manufactured. And, and in the US and around the world, this is starting more and more as China, the economy is going up, like I was saying. So more alternatives that are economical are, are forming elsewhere. And Germany is one of the better places. Getting materials, though, is expensive and shipping them um, halfway around the planet from China is still cheaper than buying them here if you can get a source. So there are, there are resources. Um, if anyone's interested, I can connect you with my manufacturer. There's also Seed Studio, S-E-E-E, -E -E, three E's, Seed Studio. Um, uh, they, they have parts, some very large standard set of parts that they make available. Does DF Robot do that too? Yeah, so DF Robot does this as well. And uh, also, uh, dangerous prototypes will allow you to buy stuff on Taobao, and they'll pack it up for you and ship it cheaply to you. Uh, that's usually for not huge quantities, but, uh, you know, like a few thousand of something. Um, so there are a lot of options. Um, and you can email me and ask questions like this. <laughs> I can give you specific answers. Um, this is this, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any explanation of why stuff is so cheap in China? Like, for example, looking at a, a big milling machine, which is like 20,000 euros here, I can find one on Taobao for 2,000 euros. And I'm having a hard time trying to understand why it's so much cheaper. Is it the energy prices, the, the, the raw material, the wages? Any idea? Yeah, the biggest part is wages. So there's... Um Right now, in, in dollars, it's about seven of their currency to one dollar, RMB, yuan. Uh, so, but one yuan, one RMB in China is almost the same as having one dollar in San Francisco. You can buy kind of the same thing. So people are paid seven times less, but they live just as well on it. So that's a huge thing. Um, that won't last forever as the exchange rates, et cetera, keep changing. The economy there goes up. But uh, there's other things too. They have huge, huge um, manufacturing plants, ones that usually aren't very good for the people who work there or the planet. Um, but uh, they have um, uh, production needs that are like millions of them units in a month. And when they don't have those needs, the peak needs, it's kind of empty. They don't want all those skilled people to go away. So they keep them busy with um, other things and they can charge a much cheaper rate for those other things as a result. That's what a story some people have told me. Um, and so I can buy a multimeter, not just like a surplus thing, uh, but a multimeter that costs $1.90 US, um, including a battery <laughs> for one. <laughs> with free shipping, right? So like, how does that work? And I think that explains how that works. For bigger tools, there's more labor involved, so it's not like closer to free like that, but it's still way less than what would have to be if people had to be paid in the West. Yeah, there's this, there's this phrase, uh, the price for cheap things are, pay, are paid somewhere else. Yeah. And how can you really um, be sure that the things are produced the way you want them? Have you, how can you really control it? Right, well, when you buy something on Taobao, you have no idea where unless you know the people. The way things work in China is people create relationships and business is that way uh, big time. So there's a business relationship. My manufacturer doesn't do everything. They subcontract out to people they have a relationship with. Before I chose my manufacturer, I went to the, the place and checked them out. I, I went to a few. Some were better than others. Some were black holes of despair. Um, I didn't choose that one. The difference between the black hole of despair and my manufacturer per unit was 25 cents. I thought it was worth that extra money. Um, so, and the, the relationships that my manufacturer has with their subcontractors is also I visited all of them and I meet the people. That's really the only way. And if you get to know the people on Taobao, you can actually get a sense of that there too. Um, not as easy unless you go to China and you can go to China because it's only about 350 euros round trip from Europe sometimes. And you can join us for the hacker trip to China if you like. <laughs> Hi, Mitch. Uh, I was wondering about how the maker spaces are like sustaining themselves. Like, is there a model? Because I haven't found like much uh, hackers kids make spaces that sustain themselves. Like they are dependent on something like university or some funds, some grants. 
So yeah. Yeah. So in the U.S., it's it's uh, it's easier than anywhere in the world because in the U.S., our government has a long history of not providing anything for us, and so we know if we're going to do anything cool, we have to do it on our own. Um, and so people with money are willing to give it. Uh, Noisebridge, we we are sustained with a seventy thousand uh, dollar annual budget. Uh, and that's paid for solely, only, by lots and lots and lots of small donations by lots and lots of people. Um, we also have membership dues. We can sell t-shirts. We can sell drinks. Uh, there's a hackerspace in Europe, uh, uh, Vienna, that makes a third of its income by selling Club Mata, the energy drink. And um, in, in Europe, donations don't work as well. But in China, they definitely don't work. Uh, Asia people usually won't give donations to things. It's a different culture. So we have to have different business models. Even if it's a nonprofit, which most hackerspaces are, you have to have a business model that will sustain your annual budget. So having small membership dues every month is something that works. Charging some reasonable amount for classes is a way that a lot of them make money. They give a percentage to their uh, instructors, presenters. Um, getting grants from the government. It's really important not to rely on those though because then you're under control. It's like, oh, you want this again next time? Jump a little higher, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so there's pluses and minuses for all these different ways, but uh, it works for all of them. Just have to try and see what works, and other hackerspaces are all willing to help. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm going from the DFR vote and you, what you said like, before. Uh, actually, uh, as a Chinese man, and uh, I have tests about uh, experiment about... Uh, Can you speak up a little? I can't hear you. Yeah, about uh, terrible tests. It's really a bad experience in China. And uh, actually, so I was very curious about uh, how, what about, how do you think about uh, Chinese education and how to improve it? So that's a main question. Thank you. Yeah, well, Chinese education is, uh, like I said, the best, it creates the best test takers on the planet. And if you really want to meet the best test takers, go to Tsinghua University, which is supposedly the number one university of China, which means that two million people apply for it and only 2,000 get in. So only those are the 2,000 best test takers on the planet, because in order to be that 2,000, you had to be the best in the examination of all of China to get there. This is a terrible situation. It's even to the point where people are going to schools and they're being trained to not think. Because that means if you think about a question before you answer it, you won't answer as many questions because it takes more time um, than the people who were trained to not think and just answer because they memorize them all. This is creating a generation of people in China that aren't thinking. Not a good thing when it's a fifth of the planet. Um, so yeah, this is why all these bureaucrats are, are really pushing for having hackerspaces as part of the curriculum where people are encouraged to play, to find things they like. A time set aside, not to learn or be trained on taking a test, uh, but for playing, trying things, see what works, failing, learning that failing is good. <laughs> That's something Chinese people, even more than anywhere else in the world, have to learn. It's very difficult to learn that failure is good for anyone. So, um, uh, and then to find things that are cool and be supported for it. This is, and then seeing that when you don't know something, there's resources available in the rest of the school to learn it when you're highly motivated to learn it. So anyways, this is right at the beginning now. There's a lot of experimentation going on with this in China, and there's a lot more to come. We'll see what works. Hopefully we'll do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Bureaucrats are involved, so there's no guarantee. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to help any way I can. I see we're coming into the discussion. I have two more questions. Is there any more? Two, three, one, two, three. OK. Um, do you see any difference in the open source culture in China, like with open hardware and open source? Yeah, well, with uh, you know the the companies that I showed slides of, plus some many others, there's open hardware is a big thing in China. Also in Shenzhen, um, Shenzhen for people around the world is most famous for making like fake iPhones and things like that. 
faking things, copying things is a fantastic way for anyone to learn. Like any artist, when they're a little kid, they're not going to like instantly come up with masterpieces. Um, they're going to copy other people and come up with their own style eventually. The same thing happens with electronics or any realm. People copy others, like I did when I was a little kid, copying other things, taking things apart, seeing how it works, put it back together. Uh, Shenzhen has been doing that. They became way better at it and way quicker at it and cheaper than anywhere else in the world, including the huge manufacturers for the actual iPhone. Um, and they're, they're now there's a couple of brands that are marketing all over the world, uh, Huawei and um, Xiaomi. Um, and they... Um, started off as copying iPhones. That whole ecosystem is basically open source without being called open source. There's this guy uh, who's an amazing uh, open hardware hacker, Bunny Huang, who lives in Singapore, and he's got blog posts about all of this. If you're interested, it's a fascinating read. Uh, they all share freely all of their information. And Scotty, the guy from Noisebridge who went to uh, Shenzhen and made that video about how he created his own iPhone with parts from Shenzhen. And I mean, a real iPhone too, with operating uh, iOS operating system. Um, but all of that is possible because they all share with each other. They don't call it open hardware, but it really is. And open software as well. All the firmware and the radio and everything and the operating systems, they all share that stuff because it makes sense for them and they can all make more money that way. And they are obsessed with making money. <laughs> Uh, I started to develop a product with uh, a hackerspace in uh, Vietnam. And of course, uh, we, I mean, we also source a lot from China. The problem is, for example, we are looking for uh, high quality displays. And we realize that when we look on the Alibaba or Taobao, it's just very difficult to, <laughs> to know which one of the good suppliers. And uh, we are very lost, so for the time being, we procured from some uh, uh, companies, um, I mean, from Europe. But we really see that, uh, I, I was wondering how to do, if there are some, for example, some companies in China, which would facilitate contact to some suppliers, or how did you get into this market? <laughs> yeah, so when you go to AliExpress, and Taobao is really the same thing, except just in Chinese. Um, you have no idea what the quality is going to be just by looking at their picture. Um, but there, there is a rating there. They fig some of the companies have figured out how to game that so they look like they're a better, higher rating than they are. But that's a good start anyways. You can also contact the people on AliExpress and they'll answer. And you can ask other people who have experience. But the main thing is to start building a relationship with the ones that have good qualities so that you can spread the word as well. That's really the only way. Um, and it's not just price either, because there's a wide fluctuation of price. Something that's more expensive might be low quality, where something is like the lowest price of all of Taobao might be the best quality. I mean, you just don't know. So, uh, or AliExpress. So, um, yeah, uh, again, you can, those companies that I mentioned before could be a good place to start. You'll pay more money with them to start, but then if you make a lot, you can start branching out to others and build a relationship with them. But if you're going to do a lot, you can contact the people and say, look, we want to make a lot. Can you send us some samples of what we're likely to get? And if we like them, we're going to buy a lot. That and they're obsessed with making money, if I said that. They're obsessed with making money. So if you can say, show them they'll make money if they send you good stuff, they'll send you good stuff if they have it. Hi. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. First. And uh, back to bureaucrats, to government financing uh, shared workspaces. Uh, the same, I think, is happening also in Italy. So just to give you an example, in Milan, in my town, in the last two years, there were more than 100 uh, co-working spaces supported by the government <laughs> that actually don't work. <laughs> and in every small town, there is a co-working or a maker space or whatever. And um, my question is, did you find a way to make bottom-up, but together with them? Because it's, I think it's a waste of money. And it's a pity. And is there a way in China to do that, to, 
It's, it's a hard road. So that's what I've, the brick wall I've been beating my head against. Um, yeah, so this is an opportunity that won't last very long. If we don't grab this and, uh, and, and make it work now, it's going to be a waste of money, like you said, and an opportunity lost because all these bureaucrats and everyone are going to go, ah, oh, hackerspaces, that was stupid. See, it doesn't work. That's because there's no community. They didn't get the money into the hands of people from the bottom up to create community of people who want this. Um, so they created those empty looking, kind of nice maybe looking, empty co-working spaces. So um, yeah, so going around, just hammering that into people, community, 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 community. <clears throat> it's important, community is important. Without that, it won't happen. So um, <clears throat> we need to have that go into the hands of people who can create community and not the way it's normally being done, especially in China, but also in low economic areas like Detroit or whatever, anywhere in the world where investors think they can get rich by investing in this, thinking that they can build a building that looks like a Silicon Valley building and then magically the next apple is going to create, be created in there. It's not going to happen. One apple is too many anyways. So, um, uh, yeah, we need to have people who can create communities. We don't need anything big. We need lots and lots and lots and lots of small, sustainable businesses. Lots and lots and lots of small, sustainable communities, all of whom help each other wherever it makes sense. <clears throat> Okay, Mitch, I'm going to be your uh, devil's advocate here. Please. So, um, I mean, with the community, there is, uh, I always see that if you want to make money out of, com out of a community, you are going to be the one person who's going to put a fence around the community and you decide who's in and who's out. So, in the software there, for, for example, is a paradise in uh, Washington State. But there's one guy who can say, uh, instead of community, community, developers, developers, and he has the go he's the guy who uh, puts the fence around it, and um, that's, uh, and he's the problem, or his, the likes of his. And if you're building a community, how can you in advance figure out that nobody can ever put a fence around that and choose who's in and who's out? Great question. So there's this uh, fantastic document online uh, that was uh, that started the hackerspace movement called the hackerspace design patterns. And one of those patterns is not what to do and what not to do. It's just showing what's worked and what hasn't worked so well for other hackerspace communities around the world. And one of the patterns is about for profit. When people are making money with something, they tend to think that it's more important than someone making a blinky light. It's not. And that has to be explicit from the very beginning. So like at Noisebridge, as an example, we, don't, we have lots of people who've created projects that they now make a living from, myself included. And um, we don't have any more priority than someone who's just sitting around um, sewing or making a blinky light or whatever. We all have equal opportunity to have access to all the tools. If people need more access to tools, they have to go somewhere else if they want priority. Um, so that's been very explicit since the beginning of our community. Other communities can make it different if they want to, um, but that's the way we do it and that's the way most hackerspaces do it. For instance, NYC Resistor was very much like Noisebridge in that regard. Uh, MakerBot grew out of one person who was fascinated with RepRap, which turned into a 3D printer, which turned into MakerBot. Uh, when it, they first put it out as a whole kit that was available to anybody, they were swamped and backordered, and they, they took over the laser cutter, and everyone else was really upset. So they went to another place that um, they could do their thing without taking priority away from all the other people using the laser cutter and other resources of NYC Resistor. And that was actually a really good thing because they were having some problems with their uh, terrible landlord. And so when they found a place, they found a place that could fit NYC Resistor above them. And so everyone moved at once and everyone was totally happy as a result. No guarantees that it always works out that well, but it often does. Okay. Mitch, thanks a lot. Um, if there are other questions, we have time to discuss afterwards. Now we have a little short break for, uh, to have some coffee. And at uh, 2.30, we start again. But 
Let me say thank you again. It was very inspiring. Thanks. And uh, a perfect end for this morning or noon section. <laughs> thanks, Mitch. Great, thanks.